Greetings, friends. My name is Steve Kelsey. And I'm Ron Leota, and this is The Roles We Play, the show about the roles we play in the games we love. On the show today, we're talking about adaptation in tabletop role-playing games. Run any setting you want using the rules you already have. All right, without further ado, let's start the show. All right, so uh, as the intro so succinctly put it, we're going to talk about um, adapting tabletop games so you can run any damn setting you want. Uh, and I am a firm believer that uh, you do not have to fit within the box of uh, what they tell you the setting is for any role-playing system. So I guess, let's, let's I, I say, wh- wh- where do you come from in that kind of mentality? Are you the, I'm going to play this damn setting you gave me, or are you the, I just like these rules? Well, I currently run a game called Through the Mill Tuesdays uh, at on Twitch TV slash uh, dying underscore of underscore exposure, which is D and D fifth edition, but in a Western Plains Desert fantasy RPG of my complete own creation, um, with guns using custom stuff via D and D Beyond. So I'm strongly in the camp of fuck the lore. The system is key, but use the lore as well in your system. I love blending random things in uh in like D&D or Fate or, you know, Vampire or something into whatever universe I'm working in. So I'm so drastically out of step and not just like the races and mechanics, but like some of the theologies and um uh uh pantheons and uh histories and just sort of like quietly remapping them. Um so I'm I'm big in uh, brew it however you want it. Uh, the systems are there. The monsters are there. All the hard, crunchy parts are there. Use those and then make your own space. Um, uh, so I was real excited when you were like, this this month is D&D month. And I'm like, yes. Or <laughs> tabletop month. And I'm like, yes. Yes, this is all I've been doing for the last few months. So I'm ready. I'm ready to talk about these things. Your mind and body have been prepared for this uh, battle to come. Certainly my body. My body's always prepared for battle. It's prepared to lose, but it is prepared. <laughs> so um, I'm a huge proponent of kind of doing what you want with systems. Now, don't get me wrong. There are particular role-playing systems that really excite me. I'm a big fan of Shadowrun and Hunter the Reckoning in particular. Those, mm-hmm. I'm more of a purist. But everything else, I'm a really big fan of telling my own stories. Telling stories is a very big part of who I am. So anytime I can glom onto a rule system and use what lore I like and kind of discard the rest, uh, the better. And I, I think there are definitely rule systems that will lend themselves better than others to this sort of thing. So let's start there, just kind of give some general suggestions for people. What would you suggest um, for role-playing systems uh, that are easily adaptable into uh, your own setting? Um, So this actually is a question that I wanted to get into because there's some things that you need to um, take into consideration when you're adapting a role-playing system for a setting. So, uh, Uh, Number one, if it's your own custom setting, uh, be flexible. If you're just building your own full world, uh, be flexible. Start looking at role playing systems. Kind of come up with your general idea for what you want, which you probably already have. That's why you're doing this. Mm -hmm. And then um, you you, want to be flexible and be like, okay, I think this is going to be kind of modern fantasy. So magic and guns um, or or it's not really going to have a lot of magic in it. Uh, what are some systems that kind of include that? Let me go browse around drive through RPG and see if there's something that's already kind of close to that. Um, and then, uh, um, and then if it's not like perfect, start thinking about how you can adapt your narrative, uh, for that a little bit more, um, so that you can align with the system. Um, and I'm going to get to the reason why in a moment. Um, if you're doing like a fandom, like you're like, I want to do a fallout campaign and there's no like big official well-crafted fallout RPG tabletop RPG. Uh, So you, you already have mechanics like from a video game or like things that happen in a book. So, you know, you need those in start really digging through like Reddit uh, sub uh, or uh, uh, Reddit sub threads. And uh, again, dry, I'm going to bring up drive through RPG all the time because it's pretty much got everything. Yeah. And you're probably not <laughs> the first person to want to do something like that. 
um, and really start doing that. But the other big thing that you need to consider <clears throat> is who's playing it with you. Are these new players or are they like veterans of multiple systems? Asking them what they've played before, before you begin developing your homebrew, because um, what you don't want is a bunch of people that have barely or never played tabletop landing into a real crunchy GURP system that requires a lot of math. What you do want, though, is you want something that they can utilize. So a big fan, when I do homebrew and everything, and I'm dealing with people that haven't played before, um, uh, I am thinking, uh, honestly, uh, just D&D 5th edition, adapt it for whatever I need it to do. Um, because not only am I using a system that has its D20 limitations and in, in, in big problems for certain mechanics, but I'm doing a system that they can then take and probably if they want to play tabletop with anyone else, almost everybody has played a, D a version of D&D &D that has played tabletop games. They're like played role playing games. There's very few people that haven't. And so that's like my first advice is when you're thinking about systems, you got to think about your world and be a bit flexible. Look around to see if someone's already done it. And then also think about the players you're trying to bring into this system and where their experience level is so that you don't give them a complicated um mechanical thing that a lot of veterans might really chew into and be like yes this is awesome and then newer people are like i don't understand this but i like it or worst case newer people are like this is great and then they play something else and they're brand new to it and they can't use anything you created in any other role-playing game um which you definitely don't want uh uh, uh so so that's sort of my balance points yeah, and I, I fully agree those are super important balance points. Um, I'll come at it from a little bit different angle since I, I fully agree with what you just said there. Um, I think one thing you have to keep in mind when you're adapting your setting is how long of a game do you want to run? What Ooh. is the story you're telling? Now, are you going to be telling a story that is going to be done in three or four sittings? Is this something you plan to run for two years? Those are really big factors because you need to figure out, is this system going to support long-term <laughs> gameplay or is it better for short-term gameplay? I've got a bunch of uh, examples of different systems I'll bring up later in the episode. Uh, uh, but for right now, I, I think it's just it's such a super th important thing to key in on how long of a campaign and story are you planning to tell um, and then kind of picking a system from there because you don't again, you don't want something where you're trying to tell an epic tale of fantasy that has a system with almost no progression. People want to feel stronger. That system of leveling up has been so ingrained in us from the video games we play that. I say people almost feel cheated if they are running a long-term game and aren't all 100% on the same page, um, which kind of brings me to my next point is that you've got to make sure your players are all on the same page. Uh, some you, you Setting expectations, I think, is such a huge part of role-playing in general, and it's something I don't, I don't know everybody really like consciously thinks about but when you set your expectations for your players, people are going to know exactly what they're getting themselves into because sometimes systems and games just aren't people's jam. So you don't want to get a player involved who's going to just hate everything you're doing because they hate anything that involves rolling more than six dice. And now you're running a system for them that they just are not their thing. Um, knowing your players, knowing what they're going to enjoy and setting the expectation of, okay, guys, we're going to use a really chewy system here. We're using, we'll use GURPS for an example. Um, so you got to really know what you're getting into. And that in and of itself can start to show, well, wait a minute. I've got like four out of my six players saying, what the hell's a GURPS? Well, maybe it's time to kind yeah. of go back to the drawing board and go, eh, maybe GURPS isn't the best place to start. Um, if those you don't know, GURPS is never the best place to start. Just don't use GURPS. Just don't do it. I know that some people have love for it, but it's not a good place for most players. Like, I ain't gonna hate, because, like, I, I really love Palladium, and I know Palladium is a bad system, even though I personally uh, have, have enjoyed playing games like Rifts for years. Uh, I know Palladium isn't great. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, I, I, so I get the GURPS fans. They they love that system, um, but it is really, really difficult. Um, so I say for like when you're doing an adaptation, 
I would stick with those rules medium systems, like the more modern renditions of D and D, like uh, fourth and fifth edition, are great examples of kind of rules medium um, for adaptation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I, and and personally, like one of my favorite go tos that I use in any, I'm personally just adapting a setting so I can play this. My go to is always World or Chronicles of Darkness. Um, kind of pick your poison there. I think Chronicles of Darkness, uh, which is w- was called the New World of Darkness, and then they kind of backtracked on that when they decided they were going to do the World of Darkness again. Um, Chronicles of Darkness is really great. It relies on the D10 system, which is pretty simple. It's just however many dots you add those together, and that's how many D10s you roll. It's yeah. very simple. It's easy to use. Um, Chronicles of Darkness has a bit more rules for... Um, working as a team and whatnot uh world of darkness is a bit more straightforward i feel personally uh, <coughs> chronicles of darkness was meant to be rebalanced to be a more competent system versus world of darkness which uh if you're not running that setting in those powers uh works really great otherwise it's wackadoo no balance system mm-hmm. um uh yeah i have played in a couple systems that i think are more adaptable uh, especially when you're talking about modern. So one of the things I love is a good license system that was built for like a category of things, um, uh, like a D6 sort of mentality. Um, uh, I would argue that one of the best systems for adaptation, if you're doing a world with no magic, but with tech and guns, and you still want it to kind of feel eventual, uh, adventure is you take the Serenity RPG and you just lift that in its entirety. And you put hmm. it down somewhere because the classes, the flaw system, and everything, it uses a lot of D6s um, uh, uh, to do its stuff. Uh, works for a lot of science fiction because you want your characters to be good but be able to fail. Um, so it would work for like a Battlestar kind of system. And it would work for um, uh, like, you know, those people desperate to play a buck rogers tabletop rpg i don't know but it would work for a lot of sci-fi systems um uh uh so don't be afraid to just like dig into things and look at their mechanics really their world mechanics i didn't think about thinking in terms of the length of the game because you can get away with a lot if you're doing a short game you can get away with a super light broad system and just be like Eh, we're only doing like a one shot or a two shot kind of thing. So I'm not going to make them spend an hour and a half building their character and reading up on shit. Um, and oh, yeah. providing a bunch of stuff. I, I don't think in terms of that. I always think in terms of, I want this campaign to go until it dies. Uh, um, so uh, uh, my mentality is always like, okay, especially if I'm building my own world. Yeah, I, I my biggest nightmare is stories that don't end. Um, the worst thing you can do to me is get me into like a TV show or a video game series and then not finish it like that. That is like my kryptonite, man. So I know when I write one of my outset of writing is always like, okay, how long is this shit going to be? And do I have the right people to play it? Because do I have people that are going to commit to a year long campaign? Okay. I don't, well, okay. I'm writing a six month campaign then. And just, and going from there, um, I'm going to share a little secret sauce with the audience here, a system I've been using a lot during quarantine. Um, I just call it, uh, Ron's D6 system or the D6 system. Uh, Mm -hmm. And all it is, is when I'm, I do storytelling games with friends over Skype or whatever, I pull out a D6 and I have everybody rank themselves. um, What's your worst? uh, What's your middle? And what's your best out of mental, social, physical, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So you could come back and say, uh, you know, my physical is my worst. Social is my middle. Mental is my best. Uh, so, uh, whenever I need them to do something that I need to do a roll, I roll the D six and a five or better succeeds. Um, now they rank their stats co- is where I get the variation. You get plus zero plus one or plus two. That's it. So your best stat, if your best stat is mental, then you get a plus two. Anytime I'm rolling for something that would be mental related. And those yep. three really simplify it. So I, the GM have a single D six that I roll occasionally and otherwise I'm just using it to facilitate a story and add random chance in when the players are trying to do actions. That sort of thing for one shots is fantastic. And Ooh, it's so good. It's a, it takes three seconds uh, unless you have really indecisive players and then it'll take a minute of thinking, well, uh, I'm, I'm pretty slow. 
and I suck at talking. That that was that was the one thing I ran into with a group of players was that everybody was just taking a big dump on themselves and they're like, yeah, but like I trip over my own feet and I've never known how to talk to people. So I don't know. I suck at everything. Can I just suck at everything? I'm like, no, we're talking right now. You're you're a very sociable person. Just just we just just rank it and it ended up working. Um, yes, yeah, so that's one I, I, I recommend if just pick up a die, roll it. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, I love that, uh, especially for people that haven't played a lot of tabletop or haven't played a lot of systems. It's a very easy thing. So they can just kind of focus on pretending to be someone and for a short term. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about thinking about things, um, and systems to adapt. Um, now, uh, one of the big things when you're adapting a system, and I think this counts for both self-created worlds mm -hmm. as well as um adapting like a property um uh and it's about knowing your world mm -hmm. now when you're playing something like uh pathfinder or or dungeons and dragons or vampire or something there's endless books um, that you can read and know and learn. And this is also important for those. But this is about just general world knowledge. Um, when you're creating a homebrew world, um, how much like back prep notes do you typically do, Ron? And you, you've got a unique experience because you have a lot of LARPing creation experience as well. Um, but how much, how much, how, how much, how much, uh, 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 how Tolkien do you get with your world when you're building it? So uh, I should probably note for anybody listening that doesn't know this, um, I've written several LARPs and a couple tabletop role-playing games. So I've been doing this like on a semi-professional level for a long time. So some of my answers might seem a little strange. Um, I take very little notes. Um, but before I started doing this literally all the time and writing things and I, and I, gained the skill to be able to come up with pretty much anything on the fly. Um, I used to take meticulous notes. I would write down full spiral notebooks full of setting notes. Um, and I still do. I guess it, dang, I want to revise my answer a little. It depends greatly on the type of setting I'm running. If I'm setting it in the modern day, almost no notes. Um, it's all mm -hmm. about the story I'm telling. I have a few story beat notes, a few characters written down, um, a general idea of where I want it to go. But the entire campaign is probably, you know, uh, the, the, the entire almost year long campaign is probably contained within five pages of a Google document. Um, on a one shot, I have half a page of notes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very light on a one shot. Um, I am the opposite. I like taking egregious notes, though I have learned to shift it. So I'm going to divide this between, let's say, a campaign about Exo Squad, the animated series set in that universe, mm -hmm. or a campaign that I invent myself. So a campaign about Exo Squad, the animated series, is about me sort of doing a book report and really getting deep into the series and the series lore and trying to find out as much as I can about it so that I have that world in my brain. Um, if I'm going to do a thing like that where it's based off of like a television show or like the Forkosakin novels or something like that, um, uh, that means I need to have watched or read it recently. I need to have consumed the media recently um, to really kind of put myself in that world to build it. Um, when you're talking about something like a home thing, I have a complete shift in how I've done notes recently, which is that I build my worlds based on the player's character's background. So like I'll have like a map or like a general idea of how the world looks physically and what world it's set in and then get the characters kind of excited about what they're going to build and then in their backgrounds, let that inform the history and the beat points of my world. Because just like regular D&D playing, and we'll get into this in the next episode, making your game about your players is 100% the goal for me. I do not have... I have tricks and things and story beats and storytelling beats that I can be proud of that I've brought into a game but the bet and and cool npcs and cool challenges but 
the narrative of the world being about the characters' journeys and what the players want to get out of it enhances the game experience tenfold. And if you start building your notes around that, you're not wasting a lot of time building notes that your players are never going to see. Um, so you're not being like, oh, you know, I have religious texts for each religion and some quotes and some backgrounds on those. Oh, none of my characters are religious because no one gives a fuck about that because they weren't raised in Catholic private school like me. All right. That was a wasted afternoon of me writing up and researching some obscure religious traditions um, to adapt. So, or or it's like, oh, I did all this stuff for these mona like monk orders or mage orders. And then I've just got a sorcerer in my party or someone born with inherent magic that's kind of an outsider to that. Well, they wouldn't know a lot about it. So I need to know some depth, but I need to know if 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 my world is an Olympic pool and goes down to uh to uh 24 deep feet deep at its deepest end i need it to be um i need to always be about 4 feet deeper than where my players are at any given time in my knowledge of things i need to have an idea that's like i can see the olympic pool i can see the whole thing i can see the stands i can see see the showers i know kind of the back room mechanics of it and then I know depth of knowledge always at least four feet deeper, but I don't need to then have a number of other facilities attached to the pool that they're never going to go into because they're swimmers. They're not there to, you know, power lift in the gym. They're not there to, uh, they're not there to run around the track, uh, outside in the field. They're never going to touch those stuff. And so, um, Knowing your world when you're ad when you're homebrewing or adapting is is really clutch. Yeah, and I and I, and I don't want it to come off like I'm saying you shouldn't know your world. Definitely know your world. I'm just the type that I keep kind of an encyclopedic knowledge of the things I'm running in my own head, uh, and I'm able to keep that straight because I, ha I I've got I've gained this skill from having to orchestrate. Uh, you know, running an event while coordinating 12 uh, game masters and uh, making sure content's going out for 200 people. Um, that sort of thing makes everything set in your head a lot. So I do have a lot of depth in, in the systems I'm running. Um, I also won't run an adaptation unless I have a genuine cyclopedic knowledge of that sort of thing. Uh, Fallout is one I've run before because I know Fallout. I obsess over Fallout. Yeah. I have Fallout merch. I play all the games. I read Fallout stuff. I have the Fallout board game I was just playing the other night. Like, it's, it's one of those things that I will run the heck out of that system, but, um, I'm probably, even though I've watched uh, all the episodes, uh, probably wouldn't run an Attack on Titan uh, tabletop game because I just <laughs> don't know the lore deep enough. Um, I had a single watch of the series and still don't 100% understand what was happening. Um, yep, I, uh, I, I think the only campaign I'd probably run without like extreme recent knowledge is I might run a Star Trek universe campaign. Sure. Uh, that would be incredibly boring um but i would run it um uh, uh star like wars was one i could run you know <laughs> star wars yeah you yeah. Could, a lot of people could run a star wars although star wars see that's the thing though is that a lot of those adaptations of fandoms there's like several versions of tabletop rpg you could pick um mm -hmm. and choose as well as published homebrew versions so there's no reason for you to get chunky in the mechanics on those things. Yeah. Save some time, buy Star that. Wars D20. <laughs> yeah, right? Just just, just buy it. Uh, question for you. This is just for me. Does not Anyone listening to this that's also a fan of Fallout might be interested, but I care more. When you run or when you think about running a Fallout campaign, do you have an existing system or did you build your own? Um, I used, uh, the D10 system. So the general idea of the dice system from world of darkness. Uh, and then I just applied the, uh, special attributes and then used the fallout flavored skills. But in the end, it was just a, it was just world of darkness. It was just vampire, the masquerade or werewolf, the apocalypse, whatever your preferred game in that system is. It was that with a fallout flavoring. Um, and I just, I just kind of tacked on special was really easy to adapt because, yeah. you know, they have... Because yeah, it wants yeah. to be. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> it yeah, wants it was, to be tabletop. 
I mean, one of my favorite um, adaptations I, I actually got I got the pleasure to play in recently was a, uh, a Wild West uh, of all things. It was set in World of Darkness, where we each played a different kind of monster who was all together as a team hunting a demon. Um, and that was a weird one because it was a homebrew setting with uh, World of Darkness rules. However, we used, I think the game is called Phoenix Dawn Point. We used its uh, story generating system. And how you do that, and this was so creative and cool. Everybody was asked by the GM to bring four printed out images to the first session. We had no characters. All we knew is we were doing Wild West World of Darkness. That was all we knew. Um, we each took those pictures and put them in a pile and kind of mixed them up. Then we had a big piece of whiteboard. And we then took the picture. We could Anybody could choose any picture they wanted. So I picked up uh, a picture and he said, okay, who's this character to you? And it was a woman in a uh, dress. I was playing a... Um, I was playing a uh, Promethean, which is basically a Frankenstein's monster. Uh, and mm. so I said, I just said, well, okay, she's my creator. And so they, they, he said, what's her name? And so I said, you know, Dr. Such and Such. And so we put on the board the image and Dr. Such and Such creator. And each person put an image on the board. Then we took like conspiracy theory strings and started tying things together on the board until we had created this interwoven connected story based entirely off of player choice and player idea. I would be mm. really excited to share this because it's, it goes really well with what you were talking about earlier about having n no, running the game for your players specifically. Yes. Yeah. We wrote half the setting for him basically sitting and sitting down and doing that. A uh, 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 thing that broke my heart recently. I'm in a lot of D and D groups, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, tabletop groups, and a thing that broke my heart recently as a game as a GM was um, was seeing somebody post just literally uh, in text, uh, "World greater than story greater than players." as their theory for how they go into a story. And I'm like, man, I feel Ooh. bad for this person's players mm. uh, because you'd have to be one of the best writers on the planet for me to want to play in a world like that, where I have no significant influence over how the campaign goes or story other than my actions. If I want that, there are video games. I will play for that. Uh, in in tabletop, it's about that collaborative story making. It's about a GM dropping something as just an aside and me latching onto it as a character and then fleshing that out or uh, bringing something back um, or, you know, moving the story in a way that the that the the GM wasn't expecting to um, go Uh and those are my favorite things as a GM to experience when players do it. So I would just hate it. Oh, just I, hate it. I, I ran into a campaign like that once, and it was one I, I left uh, after six months. I just, uh, even though I really enjoyed the people, even the GM, I, I harbor Noah Will. He's a good guy. But it was one of those things where he was very much, his story was the most important part it wasn't about the player's story it was about the setting he was running and the story he was telling up to and including like flat out cheating so a thing couldn't happen so if a player did something clever it would be like nah that that totally didn't happen he uh i see that you managed to kill that guy but psych he actually is an alien and his brain is located in his shoulder so when you removed his head it didn't kill him my boo oh. What? Like those kinds of things are so they take the power away from the individual players and the benefit of a, you know, like a theater of the mind, or even if you're using, you know, miniatures and maps is that your players get to really drive things up. Oh. It's one of the things that you can sacrifice if everyone knows that's what they're doing going into the, gr into the game. And there's absolutely groups that can collaborate in that smaller mm -hmm. way to a greater story if they're all prepared for it. But I've never met uh, a, a thing, and it's something I've learned over the years, that the more you do that, the happier the players are to show up every, you know, every session. Uh, because they don't know 
if you're going to pursue their thing or some other player's thing that's super interesting. Um, and it means that you waste a little bit of time. It means that some of your planned characters that are going to be returning villains just die in the first combat with them or someone gets really clever and really makes a moment that you thought was going to be hard and dramatic um and they undercut it by being just better at the mechanics than you are as a gm or rolling lucky or having the right you know preparedness going into the session but it just means that you've just got to be on your toes um yeah, be, will, be willing uh, uh, to roll with it. those punches, man. I mean, it's it's a, the, one of the biggest parts of being a GM, and especially with homebrew settings, it very quickly turns into, well, this homebrew setting sucks um, when really it's just a matter of you're not rolling with the punches or you're trying so hard to tell your story. And that's that's one thing I, I just want to hammer into people is that role-playing is, com- uh, is, is a community experience. It is, it is about working together to tell a story. If you just want to tell a story start a podcast like seriously yeah yeah that's and that's 100 percent fine there's nothing wrong with wanting to invent a world and tell a story Mm -hmm. it just means that it doesn't really work for a group tabletop setting unless you've all really planned that out in advance um or are doing it and this is for home games uh since i do since I have my Twitch game that's for dying of exposure, that's performative, um, uh, there's a few things I would tell players there that I don't in other campaigns that I run where I'm like, in the first couple sessions, I'm like, all right, I kind of need you all to just generally be on board with whatever I'm throwing at you. Yeah. Just to sort of get you together um, and, and make it make sense as to it being a campaign versus another campaign where it took half a year for the party to really and i would argue they're still not a congealed unit so much as they're stuck together Mm -hmm. kind of a thing which is something i had to keep playing with because people wanted to play these vastly different characters and i wanted to see if i could do that as a gm so it's a homebrew world so i can invent all these things to kind of push them together but uh i they're not like a cooperative party like you would see in a lot of campaigns. And it's a real fun challenge um, to keep coming up with reasons that they're stuck together and that they don't make the logical decision of, well, we're done. We've accomplished this goal or these goals. There's a bigger goal, but like two of us don't care about that. And it's like, well, you're stuck with it. And it's been fun watching people kind of move in and out of that role where they're like, It's not like they're friends, which is usually what happens, is that parties become allies. Um, But, you know, you got to do that. Um, I suppose suppose we're getting into, and I I don't know, I don't have the timer in front of me, so I don't know how long we've been recording. But we're getting into one thing that I wanted to talk about uh, with you, um, only because uh, this is a sneak preview for what uh, July's episodes will be like. Uh, does it differ at all for you when you're creating stuff as a campaign that's a tabletop, that's like a, like a world of darkness or a, you know, uh, 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 a D and D style, uh, game versus like a LARP where, um, you do, um, you, there's a different rhythm and everything. What are the differences for you there? So with a LARP, I have to write a consumable book. Um, LARP settings, people go in expecting to, so with LARPs, you have to basically do it all from scratch. Yeah. There are some franchise LARPs out there that will happily sell you their rules and their world, but in the end you end up still having to write a lore book. You need to kind of create things from scratch. Personally, I've run a franchise game once and I, I, I personally won't touch one again with a, you know, with a yardstick. It's just not my jam. Um, so when I'm doing a LARP, I'm having to write a consumable lore book, usually somewhere in the ballpark, 20 to 40 pages. So there is a a lot that goes into, I need to teach you what I want this world to be and set the expectation clear enough in the 10 out of the 40 pages you're actually going to read. So you get the general idea before you come in and destroy everything I planned. 
Um, <laughs> yep. And that's that's kind of that's just kind of how it goes. Um, so real quick, but we're, we're just about out of time. But I wanted to give a quick rapid fire session of some different systems I think are good for adaption. Um, so I have three categories here. Uh, for me, uh, rules heavy games. Uh, GURPS D twenty uh version 3 so that's D&D version 3 or D20 modern D20 future whatever you want to call uh and then palladium for super crunchy rules heavy there's a rule for everything types of systems mm -hmm. those are fantastic um i don't recommend them for anything other than long form campaigns with a bunch yep. of people who love rules um yep. otherwise you're going to kind of get yourself stuck uh, for rules medium games, I recommend, uh, as I was talking about a lot earlier, World or Chronicles of Darkness. Um, I also recommend 4th or 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Um, yep. They did a lot of paring it down, but it's still rules advanced enough that you have character advancement, have to know a little bit. You're going to have to do a little bit of studying to know how to play. Um, rules light, when you start to get into some of the fun, weird games. Um, so these games lend themselves to more specific genres so they can be adapted well based on genre fiasco is great if you want to do a coen brothers no rules style funny one shot fiasco is a lot of fun like that there's quest um which is uh a single d20 style game um where you only ever have to roll a d20 you get a few bonus skills that you specialize in but everything else is pretty straightforward um, and I really like this one for kids, especially because it comes with special activities for spells like drawing pictures or reciting poems, which I think is a great way to engage non tabletop role players and, and kind of put something familiar, uh, in there. Uh, I also like our last best hope, which is a real hoot. Um, it's a three act narrative game, um, based around eighties and nineties action films. So, uh, Armageddon oh, that's is fantastic. Is, and Armageddon was one they use as a really great example of the three acts and, you know, and the third act you are now confronting the problem. Um, and yeah, the last one I'd recommend, which is, is, is great. The best system I've ever played for horror games, uh, that are one shots. And that's the system dread, which involves a Jenga tower. Um, that one's wild. I love it. It's, it, it, I am a huge horror nerd and, the act of making you physically tense to do an action and draw a Jenga tile for every action you do that could have an, a big negative world impact, that just butt-clenching tension that Jenga causes already combined with horror themes is perfect for any so horror good. you want to run. Um, I only have a couple to add to that. Um, mm -hmm. For middling stuff, I'd say... Um, savage worlds or Ooh. fate probably mm -hmm. um uh they have enough rules to matter but they're very different than say the fourth fifth edition d20 type stuff so if you're kind of done with those um plus they have a ton of uh, uh like materials for them uh so you don't have to invent a lot of like the but what if this but what if that kind of system you can kind of browse around for that um and then um, I don't know if there's a name for this system. So I'm just going to kipe it straight from uh, what I saw it from, which is I watched the McElroys play a, um, uh, like a, like a four convention one shot called, uh, called the Dadlands. If you look up Dadlands on YouTube, um, you'll see Brennan Lee Mulligan from Dimension 20 is their game master. Oh, wow. And then <laughs> they are all players and they have these little fanny packs um, that they're all wearing that have green and red tokens in them. And uh, it's essentially the idea of like the moral cho choice that a lot of video games offer. A lot of like Mass Effect-y, Fallout-y, hmm. um, uh, Elder Scrolls-y kind of games um, where it's like you can go the good path or the evil path. And so um, in this one, it was... a uh, it was a fantasy world uh, that was really ridiculous for comedy where uh, they, the red tokens uh, 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 were like hard-ass tokens and the green tokens were deadbeat tokens. So you were hard-ass dad or deadbeat dad. And you had to make a decision on how many tokens are like 
you try to do something and then the GM would be like, well, that'll be, you know, two tokens or one token or three tokens. And so you're trying to solve it with, uh, with, with the amount of tokens. And so oh, cool. you're like, this is kind of like a, like a, like a relaxed cool dad thing. So it's a green token or two green tokens to solve it. And if you pull out, um, uh, the wrong color token, uh, from your fanny pack, which you're blind pulling, you then give that to the GM, which means you have more of the other tokens. And if you run out of one type of token or the other, you become a full hard ass or a full deadbeat and can't take actions in the other category. Interesting. And so it's fun for a one shot because it's not good for long form na narrative. There's no real character development there um, or anything like that. But it's a really easy to understand game. Like uh, it involves sort of like a physical action. So once we're all done with quarantine, it's easy to play around on the table. You can sort of homebrew a thing, and it's kind of a high comedy thing. And you just sort of build into the like one shot, like a sort of like a uh, a dark side, light side kind of mentality. Um, and so uh, also, it's fun to wear fanny packs and kind of blind pool. So. Uh, you're, you, you, every time you reach into the bag is a moment of tension of what you're going to do. And you just give enough tokens for people to fail a few times. Um, but yeah, that's a really interesting system that I want to try. It's probably the next system I want to try. So go to YouTube. Uh, you can, you can watch the, them play it on YouTube for free. It's a hilarious little campaign, um, that they run for a convention and um uh and uh uh it's really enjoyable and it's again one of those light systems are really nice if you're just looking for something to do and you don't have a bunch of people that are willing to commit to uh every other week games um uh and and also to draw people into the idea of playing around a table uh for complete noobs but uh also there's another dice system or non dice system called uh amber diceless uh, role playing, which is a great diceless role playing system that's super open and very adaptable. That's all just sort of like it's similar to your uh, D6 system. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but people are kind of just sort of choosing what they're good at and what they're bad at. And then you want your party to sort of balance itself out in that. And then as the GM, it's sort of your responsibility to give everybody moments of time to shine. But uh, there's lots of fun in the Amber Diceless system. But yeah, so those are my recommendations. Nice. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I just wanted to say thanks to everybody for joining us uh, on the show. I, I had fun with this one. I'm a big tabletop nerd. I'm a big nerd in general, but I love tabletop games. It's kind of my it's kind of my bread and butter. We do a lot of video game stuff because I did a podcast for years just about role playing. So I was kind of excited, but it's good to kind of go back to form and talk a little bit about tabletop. So, yeah. You can oh, yeah. uh, check out the show at uh, therolesweplay.podbean.com or facebook.com slash therolesweplay. Uh, come say hi to us if you got ideas for shows. We're happy to talk about the stuff you want to hear. And uh, Steve, how do they find out about uh, this dying of exposure thing I've heard so much about? Uh, well, they can hit us up on dyingofexposure.com. That's the website. Uh, that'll link to everywhere. YouTube.com slash dyingofexposure is pretty much where all the content gets uploaded. Um, uh, very soon, uh, the, uh, other than this, because it's already on the roles we play, um, other than this, any other content in audio format, uh, in podcast format will be coming up under dying of exposure. It'll always be tagged dying of exposure colon, and then whatever the series it is. Cause we do multiple videos of things, uh, and then hit us up on Twitch, um, uh, twitch.tv slash dying underscore of underscore exposure. Um, and uh, on Tuesdays, 7.30 p.m. Pacific, I run a campaign uh, in 5th Ed D&D &D World. Um, and then on Thursdays and soon starting on Mondays uh, at noon Pacific, I play some retro classic video game RPG. Um, uh, right now I'm playing Chrono Trigger, and that will still be true when this episode comes out. So uh, I'm playing through Chrono Trigger, and it's the only time I play it is when I'm streaming it. And those are both like two hours ish streams. Uh, so you can watch that or you can catch up on the YouTube. But yeah. Right on. Well, all right. This has been a lot of fun. Again, thanks for listening to the show. I am Ron for Steve and the roles we play. Play myself out.